say you want a motorcycle, and your significant other will not let you entertain that idea whatsoever for your midlife crisis. What do you do next? Well, you get yourself a badass Electra 8 Ball Cruiser. Cruise around the neighborhood and let the wind blow through your hair. Yeah, that's right. This is going to be a full refurbish. From end to end. After this. Welcome to I Know A Guy Bicycles. Hanging out with a guy. Hi, I'm Justin the Guy. Obviously, I have a garage shop. Take scary out of used one bike at a time. If you want to be kept up to date on latest projects and topics, please like and subscribe. Welcome back to I Know A Guy Bicycles. Hanging out with a guy. Hey, I'm Justin the Guy on this whole bike series. Check this out. Yeah, cruisers. They have their own niche. Absolutely. I've worked in the shop that oh, had a lot of them. Is they. They were Lee Cyclery back in the day. And Parker Bikes, we were a small community where cruisers weren't that common. I mean, we worked on a few, didn't really sell that many of them. It wasn't really that popular because it was a really kind of hilly neighborhood communities. And the town was still pretty small and they had a bike path, but it wasn't really developed that much yet. Now, full blown cruisers would have been great. They had a lot more restaurants, places to go. But my first experience with a lot of cruisers were when I worked at Lee Cyclery, which is right across, uh, they had a location right across uh, from CSU campus. Being a college town, cruisers were an awesome way to get around, uh, simpler to deal with for me mechanical reasons. This one's a three speed, a lot of them were internal. There's enough gearing to get you where you need to go as a college kid, point A to point B. I remember working in that location during the uh, dorms being open and parents would be flocking in and buying bikes from like the Trek 820s, your $300 package, $400 package bikes with the locks and the lights and all that. In addition to, we'd have like a row of these cruisers from Electra, Nerve, and a couple other brands just all laid out in front. You, could, you would not miss it when you drove by. It was like, you know, 50 cruisers hanging outside, um, wait, just waiting to be picked up and rode, right? I mean, not by stolen, but, you know, you know what I mean, <laughs> by actually buying them. The other location I worked at, they had three. The other one was more of a tech area, Suburbanite. We had a few cruisers there, but not sold as many there as well. And they also had one in Loveland, which is, it, it didn't really have that in it. But when you had that location and that vibe it, and see these things going through, they're beasts. I mean, even today, they're they're pretty, t I mean, this is aluminum and I about pulled my everything <laughs> trying to get it up on the stand. So, you know, please donate and I'll get one of those lift jacks at some point because I'm not going to be, <laughs> yeah, just kidding. Um, you've seen those like multi-thousand dollar ones. I get it for the e-bikes and uh, man, those bikes are heavy like this and uh, Electra is nothing related to electric bikes. Electra in the time was a company made out of, uh, based out of California. Currently they've been purchased by Trek, uh, I'd say about seven or eight years ago. So they're underneath the Trek umbrella now. Uh, and you know, they're, they try to keep, keep a lot of the vibes still there, which is kind of cool. Uh, and it's a pretty, you know, back then and even today, they're actually pretty decent bikes. They're better quality cruisers. They hold a little bit of their value. But the eight ball, hey, come on. This is like one of those unique ones. I had to like, you know, get it and try it out. I figured I'd try a couple cruisers. Um, just kind of fun for the area uh, where I'm at. Uh, maybe, you know, entice maybe some individuals out there that want to ride the bike paths and be more of a style versus function. But hey, you know, if you have several bikes in your stable, I'm sure you probably have a cruiser or I, we have a couple of rolls from Specialized that we just hit around the bike paths and so forth. Nothing high tech. They're pretty simple, but hey, they're fun, right? That's putting fun back into cycling where you don't have to have that four or $5,000, $10,000 bike to do so. Here's a great option. Get yourself a cruiser. It has a wide range of fitting. Uh, size of people can fit this. This has some cool elements like a fender, you know, chain cover, um, a three-piece crank. It is aluminum with a, oh, it was like a triple mount. 
double mount fork. I mean, kind of cool. So my intention on this guy is, well, besides being coolness factor, and I figured hey, it'd be kind of cool to just work on, is also I want to do um, a lot of detailing and not necessarily restoration because I'm not a restorer, I'm a refurbisher. Um, there's a two, I mean, it sounds very familiar, similar, but they're two different things. One's more functional or fashion, one's just fashion 100% and trying to get its original state. But I'm going to go towards that direction of kind of bringing out the paint, try to get out the scratches by using my uh, techniques with Adams polishes and also lithium um, ceramics and cleaners. What I've learned in the last year and a half of doing detailing of frames on those high-end road bikes that you can catch videos below. In the more section where I go into more detail there, I'm going to do the same thing with this guy. Well, what's cool about it? I mean, it has interesting 24-inch wheels, big motorcycle width size. I did test ride this out in the... It's just kind of cool. You're just like, I, you know, just... Having a great time, and it's definitely going to be a head turner once it's, um, well, it's a head turner now, but it's going to be a head turner when it's completed. Also decked out and polished and um, kind of like, you know, those classic car type deals. Classic bikes right here. You can't get any cooler than this. There's several channels out there I've seen that do just cruisers. Um, I'm not treading, I'm trying not to tread on any of those guys' water. I'm just going to try to put my own personal spin on this particular one. Um, and maybe a few others that I have in the stable that I need to go through. But hey, you know, the, de the detailing of the saddle, you know, the checker flag or checker flag pattern for the rear wheel. Get those red spokes. I mean, we got cobwebs and dust and dirt and grime. So I want to take this thing apart, do some fine dye detailing, cleaning, get the paint to just pop. The tires are actually in still really good condition. So that's a win. I think the chain is still fine. I'll probably just need to clean it. I might need to re repaint the cranks because they're just, they may not have that paint, but they also have the warp and worn out part. I might switch out the pedals because they look kind of, I mean, this has been used. Let's not, let's not, you know, beat around, beat around the bush about that. It has been used. Um, it's been thrown out in the elements. So it's kind of like one of those things where let's try to get this back up to life and to show room quality. You know? So, Let's just dive into this and thanks for hanging out and let's do uh, let's do this uh, journey together. Let's check this out. Well, what should I dive in first? Well, let's just see. Let's go over that. Since we've gone over the details of the actual company itself, Electra, ah, and the words beginnings and where it currently lives today. I'm not sure if they make the eight ball in their current lineup. I think some of those funner like Rat Fink and those kinds of niche kind of cruiser styles have been eliminated from the line and mainly just kind of their mainstream cruisers with the three and a couple of the Hawaiian series, the more popular ones of course. They all had to scale down. And yes, um, I don't know if they were ever made in the United States, but uh, the company originally Electra was and they had all sorts of cool stuff which I carried some of the product line with it like baskets and fenders and bells and all sorts of kind of neat things so if you go into your Trek store you should be able to see some variety or on their website too but any case this particular one um, with the flared about back kind of like your chopper style sitting position this one actually is kind of the idea where the um, the Electra the townies were kind of modeled after. The townie is a cruiser style back <laughs> bike that instead of sitting above your crank that shifts you back. In other words, you can keep your feet on the ground or touch the ground, but still have that leg extension. They still make those today, which are a pretty nice bike. They also make an electric version, an e-assist version of that as well. Pretty cool um, with a little more gears and so forth. Uh, a little heavier, but then again, those e-bikes are kind of tankish anyway, so could you put a conversion on this? Sure, will I? Oh, hell no, um, but it's one of those situations where uh, this has a three-speed, you know, where I'm going to be riding this will be pretty much in the flats. Um, it still has pretty it's cool things like the eight-ball valve covers. I mean, if I can get the spider web to come off of the valve cover itself. 
Thank goodness there's a lot of threads on that. Um, yeah, so I'll even try to clean these guys up and maybe touch them up. They're kind of scratched up and so forth. Crazy, huh? <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, okay, I'm done. No, just kidding. Um, <laughs> there's going to be a lot more to this. Uh, the tires, I'm not sure. I probably can find the tire replacements if need be for this size. Um, the only thing that's kind of missing is the decaling, but everything else looks pretty good. It's still a lot of more, it still has a lot of meat to it. Um, the, the paint, well, it's actually not paint, the sticker that they had on this, I'm going to have to be very careful when I clean it because I don't want to you know, tear away from the paint. So it's going to be a light cleaning of the rims, but then I'm going to put probably a ceramic coating on top of it once it's really cleaned um, to actually kind of polish that up or after I polish it, put some uh, a ceramic coating on there to add that protection from UV, weather, and water. Uh, of course, cruisers, you know, you're going to go maybe through some puddles and elements and that kind of thing, and you want all that to kind of shed off, just like your vehicles, right? If you're into detailing your car and that kind of thing, that's it's the same stuff, same materials, crosses over quite nicely. Um, I'm surprised that the cycling industry hasn't really embraced the whole detailing thing. I know there's a couple uh, lines like uh, Muck Off has a couple polishes and so forth. And there's always been a bike polish out there, but it really hasn't been something that with a level of detailing of vehicles and maybe people in the cycling industry that or in the actual riding are not that crazy about detailing. But if you look at some of the paint jobs that are coming off the line, um, that are custom, <laughs> I think you'd want to preserve that as much as possible, especially if you pay the extra coin to get that. Like the Project Ones and also Specialized has, I think a newer version of like paint booth type stuff. And there's also some custom paint companies out there that'll paint your bikes, um, pretty pricey, but you can get some pretty cool designs and so forth out there too. Um, but needless to say, I'm gonna try to get this one up to, you know, try to restore the, the paint that's currently on it, maybe touch it up. Black is a little bit easier than some of those off colors or unique colors. <laughs> I, mean, I wouldn't even try to attempt to touch up a Klein paint job because the Klein paints are really, really pretty intense. And uh, usually there's a lot of material that you can work with on those paint jobs to kind of buff it out. But if it's a clear chip that goes straight to the frame, not much you can really do about that unless you take to a professional painter that can match the, you know, that actually has the whole paint booth and kit and caboodle. So how to work on cruisers, just, you know, basic cruisers, well, they get more basic in the sense it's easier to work on, but they still have the same three things, right? You got the frame and fork, the wheels, and the componentry. La right, the component tree is less. You got a coaster brake on this one. That means you pedal backwards to stop. This has an internal three-speed hub, which is a pin that goes inside that changes the gears. So you know, the difference between a three-speed, a five-speed, and a nine-speed internal hub, it's just a smoother transition in gears. The ranges are from top to bottom are about the same. There's only so much they can do with that capacity of the internal hub. So you might get a little bit more, but not, not huge. So don't get the idea like, oh, I'm gonna do a nine speed internal hub and have like a 1140 range in the back tooth. No, not gonna happen. It's gonna be kind of stuck within that range. Maybe some newer ones are coming out, but some of those high-end ones, uh, the roll-off ones, and some of the Shimano Nexus, I mean, just the hub itself could put you about a grand. So, and, and the sky's the limit when it comes to stuff like that. So, in any case, this is your Nexus uh, three-speed Shimano, which is pretty decent. The hubs, well, the Shimano is a, a Nexus hub, but the front is probably some, um, off brand, but it is a flanged out one, kind of like that Gary Fisher hub that I showed in a previous video. Uh, but it's, you know, it's bolted on kind of thing. So yeah, you're gonna have to use, it's not quick release on this guy, it's bolt. So it's a 15 millimeter, usually what it is, or 15 or 17. So that's how you're gonna get the wheels off. And going through the cables and housing, this has a bad plate, but I think I have a replacement that will work that I got off of eBay for, I don't know, 10, 15 bucks, something like that. Clean this up, give it a little better connection. Um, so we're going to put that bad boy on there. Clean these up. You know, if I could pop out the dings of fenders, I would, but um, it doesn't look like it has too much of that. It does have some scuffage. 
For some weird reason, the kickstand is gone, so I'll have to find another kickstand that may work on this guy, or I might have to source that. But it does come, it does have its flame <laughs> grips, which look like they're still in pretty good shape, so we're good there. Uh, but yeah, basically, it's, you're going to treat it as kind of like a glorified BMX bike with a three-speed hub. That's really kind of how it goes. And if you're a tinker like me, back in the day when we had our BMX bikes, we'd tear those things apart, put them back together. And sometimes they work better. Most of the time they were more weird. Um, I had one buddy that decided to take the brake shoes out of the coaster brakes, so it became a free wheel. Uh, about died that summer. Anyway, <laughs> you do what you do in those days, right, as a, as a youthful. But um, let's start popping into this thing. And first, I need to get it stripped down so I can get to the frame and detail it and take the fender off and do everything I can to make it restored-ish, more refurbished of my talents. Bring on the magic. Eight ball. Okay, don't have to be afraid of three speed hubs. I mean, they're actually a pretty simple once you look into them. You wanna knock it down to the lowest gear. Oh, slid right off. But this bolt here is one that holds it in place and that just slides right off. You don't wanna lose track of this little guy. This is the pin that drives the three speeds, um, goes back and forth and we'll, you'll have to do adjustment. There is an adjustment slot in between so when you get in the middle then you can adjust the cable it is just a your standard cable style um, back and forth uh, it is a little more trickier to work with if you have to replace it um, but there's kits out there to do so but you want to make sure you set this aside that exposes the the nut here to loosen it but before you do that you want to take release the coaster brake arm what the heck is that let me show you So this is the coaster brake arm. You gotta have this clamped to the frame for it to work. It's basically usually a 10 millimeter bolt and nut. So I'm gonna see if I can thread my hands through here, like so. And then you take your 10 millimeter, yeah, 10 millimeter. Do I have this right? Oh, I'm gonna have to do it the other way. All right, so I'm gonna try to thread through here with my little 10 millimeter socket and try to unscrew this blindly. <laughs> Usually they're not too, too tight and just need to screw that out. And these usually have like a little screwdriver portion. This is where your little ratcheting sockets like what I have here comes in great play because get in here. You can kind of unscrew it like so. Basically you got to take this little bolt and nut out completely. And try not to drop it on the floor because like anything that hits the floor, it usually likes to take off and run away. And that's how you get rid of the nut and bolt. Once that is released, and for giggles, I am going to take this band clamp off. It is not protected coating on it or anything. These just basically flare out to take off. And I will either put a protection on the frame, but I definitely want to clean underneath this where it was. And you can see how that arm just moves now. So if you hit the brake, it's gonna flail around. Um, it may not, it probably, it won't stop you. <laughs> you, will, you will crash before that happens. Kinda excited to use a whole bunch of tools I don't usually use very often. Um, so this is gonna be your 15 millimeter uh, on front and the back, I believe, on both. So you wanna do like a quarter turn on one side and then do the quarter turn on the opposite side. Reason being is sometimes these get wedged really tight on one side, and if the other side is completely loose, you can't break that first connection. But once you do that 
first quarter turn or so forth, then it, it's easier to release. And also when you put these back on, you do the same thing. You tighten up one just a little bit, not all the way, and then you adjust the other and you kind of go back and forth until you have an equal tension on both, both of the nuts. So now this is ready to drop out. And all I need to do is just make sure that chain comes off of that free little free wheel here. And there you go. That's how you take off this monster wheel. Oh man, this thing is heavy. So these are tanks, like they're heavy. So your standard, uh, because your standard work stand, if it's a portable one, may not support the weight too much, like a tandem, it's pretty heavy. That's why I have the industrial park. But if you do use one of those, just be mindful of my tip. So you wanna make sure it's probably lower to the ground, use buckets to hold it in place or whatever to secure it, to make sure you're not getting slammed by this big old tank of a bike. Um, so I'm going to these, it's just same thing. They're 15 millimeters on both sides. So I'm just gonna break one side loose. I'll uh, break the other side loose too. I'm like, oh, look at here, it had two different bolts. One's kind of cool looking, rounded out. Other one's not, it's just your standard. So I might have to go find me some parts. And they do sell them. And if this is done right, there's a lawyer tab style of a washer. It's this guy here, it's uh, beveled. I'll just take it off completely here. So you have a little spacer here that fits in. That prevents the wheel from flying off or for some reason they use loosen up. So I'll be digging around, seeing if I can find extra bolts on those. So this does not have a power link. And when you're doing with single speed chains, you can technically push this pin, not all the way through, but through the second side of the plate. And then you can push it back and reuse it. So I'm still in debate if I'm gonna keep this chain or if it needs to be replaced or I just want something that's you know cooler looking um, because it looks like I'm gonna have to order some parts anyway to get this home completed. But for right now, I'm gonna throw this in the ultrasonic cleaner and see if I can get it to polish up. Some of these fancier ones will either be coated with black or chrome. Um, so might want to do something pretty cool like that, but we'll see what we can do with this one first. So here we have the fender. I'm going to take this off so we can get to the inside of the frame as well as detailing the fender itself. There's one bolt here. And there's another one in here, but I can't get to that. Oh, there yeah, I can. Through the chain ring. And again, don't lose these bolts because you'll have a hard enough time finding it. Oop. Like so. Kind of crunchy. Ooh, I might be buying a little more parts for this guy. Get it up to snuff. It is loose. Maybe the bearings just need to be done. And the chain ring looks pretty straight ish. I might have to bend that back a little. Yeah, this had some, had some usage for sure. Let's see if we can clean it up. Oh boy, wish it was in better shape, but in any case, that's what I'm here to do. Inch. All right, let's see if we can get this to pop off. It's all about angles, right? There you go. Right tool for the job to do the job right. Apparently that parts tool I have thick kit came with this guy, so 
Never thought I'd use it, but here I am. <laughs> All right, now we're proceeding to take the crank set off so we can clean it up and check that bottom bracket. It seems to be not quite right, so get one of those bolts out. Like so. Whoop. On the other side. So you have the covers. That's really, really all they were. And that one. What do we got here? We got a square taper. This is going to be interesting to see if the square taper tool fits in here. It should. I'll thread it in all the way. Just make sure you have the best contact possible on that square taper bottom bracket. And this is why they have a short handle. Hopefully it's deep enough. <laughs> oh, no. Maybe it goes in further. It doesn't seem like it wants to do contact. And if it doesn't work, I'll have to see if I have another one. Oh, contact's a little. Is it enough? Yep, barely. So you see you got that going on there. This is integrated, so there's no changing this chain ring out. And we have a uh, mess of getting this to come back out. Yeah, there we go. So now I gotta figure if this bottom bracket's toast, and do I need to get a different bottom bracket? not, but for the time being, we're going to clean this up, try to straighten it, and then on to the other side. So the idea is to get this stripped down to the, to the frame. Crank puller will make contact. Oh, yeah, barely. Oh, I'm at a weird angle. And now we are going to now we're going to go in to get this now we got to the raw frame and now we proceed to do the first of many layers of cleaning well number one I just want to get the gunk off and see what I'm looking at and then dive in to see if I can use some of the scratch and swirl or compound and polishes to get this frame to look a lot better than it was and get rid of some of these chunks and chips and scratches. And then if there's anything I can do for detailing, we will address that as we see fit. But I'm gonna try to get this thing to be 
as miraculous as possible considering how cool it is and how much aluminum has been invested in building this thing. I wonder how many pop soda cans have been used <laughs> to build a frame of this size and magnitude. It is quite impressive to figure out. Yeah, it is a, a lot of weight <laughs> just for the frame. And uh, we will proceed to do so here shortly. And hopefully I can get some of this stuff to really clean up to be beautiful. In some areas, though, I need to probably add a little more stronger cleaner to kind of get any weird smudges off that are from other paint or just stubborn, stubborn, stubborn grease. So I will proceed to keep on cleaning. This is the Big frame, so it's going to take a, a lot of extra elbow to dive into this and get it to be miraculous. Oh, here we go. Well, that's a scratch and swirl. Let's uh, take a peek at what the compound will do. So what I did is I get I got some different colored fiber cloths. One to represent each stage. So the oranges are going to be my scratch and swirl stage. So I'm not cross contaminating my fiber cloths. So ooh, got a good gloss on this already. So I'm going to do a little section here, kind of show what I'm going to be doing, and then I will proceed. I will proceed onto the rest of it, but just wanted to give a little look-see and sample of what we can do with our current process and bringing this frame back to life.
Alright, this is my compound rag. So, try to correct a lot of this scuffed up areas. I may have to do this a couple times, but this is the section I'm going to feature. Obviously, the eight ball is the focus point. And now we're going to try some of that polish. The Adams polish. All right, now here we have the high gloss polish that we're getting from Adams. And boy, it is really coming to shine. I mean, that is bringing it back to life. You get a lot more of that glazed look to it. So that is going to be something else once we get this all all detailed up and get some ceramic slam on there. The lithium from lithium, the ceramic coating, get a couple of layer of protections on that. I'm sure it's going to look even more miraculous. So I'm going to keep diving into this and then we'll review the actual application of the ceramic slam. So, but I'm going to be putting a lot of elbow into this for sure. Ah. So here we have it after we detailed the frame with Adam's swirl and scratch and swirl and compound and polish. Now look at the shine. Granted, there's still, you know, blemishes in there, but there's that is all I can really do without all this particular pre-scarring. But you know, this bike is a badass Super 8, therefore. A little bit of blemishes is just what it's called for. Check out that shiny one. It's kind of like scars on this particular one. But let's apply the surface cleaner and the ceramic seal. Make sure we get a good coating of protection on this beautiful frame. First, we're going to uh, kind of just wipe it down with a hyper clean surface. Make sure I got pretty much all the contaminant portions off of the surface of the clear coat. Even though it's been polished, I want to make sure and wiped off, but I want to make sure I get all those extra little hidden gunk areas. Just a quick wipe to, you know, to make sure I got the frame as clean as possible before I add that ceramic. Just were just extremely hard to get to. Considering this is, you know, a bicycle and not a car where you have a whole bunch more of little nicks and crannies. It takes a lot more to get all those little fine details. Give us a good little coating. Then we're going to add the ceramic. Figured I'd do this in the sun so you can get a good. And for me, I'm going to coat, you know, underneath pretty good. So there's pretty good protection on that as well. Okay, so I think we're ready, ready for the slam. Put some on my applicator here, then I'm just going to give it a good coat, and I'll go over it at least twice, if not three times, to ensure I got all the spots, in addition to layering is a technique where you get that added protection and coating so we will make this thing as 
very detailed as we can without basically repainting it <laughs> and starting all over from scratch. Well, there you have it. We've got the coating on there. I put on three different layers. Time I went around each time it dried and got a good, I'm pretty much shy of dipping this in the whole frame in a vat of ceramic slam. <laughs> you about as close as you're gonna get. We're doing three different layers, which means I probably would caught at least most of the spots, at least twice, if not more. And especially the big surface areas on the bike frame are definitely uh, the three layer coverage. I really focused also on the bottom portion of it where that protection is really needed to kind of shed that water and gunk off when you rinse it, when you get into those puddles and so forth to kind of protect the frame where, you know, people don't look, but the dirt still is there. It doesn't mean it's clean. So therefore, I got in those little nits and crannies, also put a layer on the, the fork as well as the bars just to have an extra coating there as well. And in addition to hopefully this frame will come out and pop like it should in its original state. Uh, you know, of course, I'm gonna have a little bit of scarring here and there, but you know, a scar is like I have too. It just makes it more badass, right? Yeah, let's make it a big, you know, big impression piece. When you see it, you're like, oh, that's pretty sharp. Um, maybe I'll come up with some kind of a decals of some sort called boo-boo stickers because I come across a lot of frames where I don't touch up or can't touch up the paint because I'm restoring, not refurbishing, or no, I'm refurbishing and not restoring. <laughs> um, in that case, I can put a sticker on there showing that I cleaned everything underneath, but I put a, you know, a nice little decal. Uh, something that has more of a gel to it, like, you know, my wife's fingernail nails, and maybe I'll just use some of those and just kind of cut them out accordingly and just clear coat those little bad boys on there and do a little uh, ceramic on top of that and see how that looks. Get a couple different variety packs. <laughs> Thinking out loud, <laughs> crazy. And if you didn't like it, you can just peel it. If you can try to touch up paint it yourself, there's processes of doing that. And unfortunately, I just don't have the time um, to be able to do that in, in each frame. So here we have it, the eight ball. Let's reveal the final shine by putting on some ceramic slam with the actual fiber cloth. Ooh, 
So it leaves a little haze on there when it dries, and once it's dry, then you can definitely give it a good wipe down. Wow, look at that shine. I can see myself and all the ridges. Yeah, boy. This is a bad boy. Uh-huh. Yep. It is definitely going to be one of those talk of the town bikes when you're riding around in the neighborhood or going to your local drinking hole or restaurant with the family. If not, a younger lad would be like, hey, check this out. This is a, a vintage eight ball. Well, it's not so vintage like in the 50s or the 60s, but hey, I don't think they make these anymore. So it's going to be pretty hard pressed to, you know, see yourself rolling down the path and uh, being in this very meticular, miraculous state and uh, super clean. Oh my goodness, that uh, chrome. Yeah, uh, chrome really likes the, the slam as well, so give it a little extra protection. But there's also chrome cleaners out there and so forth. I figured to give it a try and see what it looks like on the chrome. But a little bit of protection, whatever else I do to it is just going to be adding to it, not subtracting from the quality of the craftsmanship of this frame. This is all aluminum. It's a chunk of aluminum. So for aluminum, you know, knowing aluminum is supposed to be light, this guy is not super light. It is definitely stout and very girthy is a good word for it. And um, even on the flat parts here, they're a little big. It's probably about 4,000 bottle or cans of soda <laughs> to make this. So, um, yeah, do the equation of that. Figure that out. Oh, man, that is, woo. Ah. So, yeah, I'll do the fender as well. And the chain guard will need to be cleaned. Uh, polished and coated in addition to I took those off so I can get to the whole frame then reinstall those and uh, have it mainly just uh, pop and you're getting those little cracks here oh. so you know I can do the shoe polish buff and really get a good shine there and protection wow awesome well Sorry to bum you, but this is definitely going to be a part two series. I can't do all this in one sitting, plus i got to order some parts to kind of finish up this project here. But it's a good stopping point of showing where the shine on the frame is at this point. And uh, yeah, I mean, if you want to try those products, they're listed below. It's a ceramic slam from Lithium, as well as the surface cleaner. Also do the Adams polishes uh, as well. So with all the combination of all those different types, whoever's the best is what I'm gonna use. That's what I've been using so far and it seems to be working really well. And uh, if it's nice in your neck of the woods, have a great day and go for a ride. Smash those buttons below. Here's some detailed pictures of the frame and on to the next project. From the garage, have a wonderful day.